Hi, this video is a basic introduction to finding economic data. I'm going to introduce you to four big warehouses of data. But before I show you those, I want to first give you a simple suggestion for how you can go about finding economic data uh, that's related to the question that you're interested in. And that suggestion is to simply find existing research which already uses the variables that you're interested in and see what they used for data. So here I am, I'm on Google Scholar. Google Scholar is a search engine for academic research, scholar.google.gov or .com. Uh, so let's say we were interested in finding a data set which had something on firearm ownership and homicide. Then I'm just gonna search for firearm ownership homicide. And this will pull up a bunch of papers which presumably talk about those two things. So, for example, this first result here is rates of household firearm ownership and homicide across U.S. regions and states, 1988 to 1997. So you can guess from just the title of the paper that probably they're going to have some data that's about firearm ownership, about homicide. So those should probably be two of the variables. And my guess, without having looked at the paper, is probably their data is going to have observations which are regions or states, uh, but they may well have observation at a smaller level than that. So you would click through the paper, you read through the paper, any decent paper is going to have a description of where the data came from. Now, you won't necessarily have access to the data that they, uh, that they used. A lot of data sets are private, either because they're, you know, proprietary data to the person who collected them, so the person who collected it may expect to be paid to uh, for use of the data, or the data may be private out of, you know, privacy concerns for the person who was surveyed. Uh, so this is a good place to start when you're looking for data. But I also want to introduce you to uh, to some other places that you can look. So the first place I want to show you is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is bls.gov is their website. So uh, they're a government agency. They're part of the United States Department of Labor. And to give you a sense of what kind of data they have, I'm just going to click where it says Data Tools here. And you can see the sorts of data that they collect. So they collect data on inflation and prices. They have a bunch of data related to employment and unemployment. They have data related to pay and benefits, things like that. So you're seeing they have a lot of really classic economic variables. And these are generally, BLS data sets are generally really high quality. They're easy to use. They're nationally representative in general. Uh, and so, for example, when you read the unemployment numbers or the employment numbers in the newspaper, when you read about inflation, you know, if you see something where in the headline it says the economy added 100,000 jobs in October, uh, usually those numbers that you read in the newspaper are coming out of BLS data. Uh, so in addition to those really classic economic variables. Now, I will say uh, one thing you should be aware of, though, is that these data sets aren't just going to an observation in these data sets isn't just going to be the entire United States economy in October of 2009. Instead, the observation is going to be like Susie or Jim. It's going to be, you know, an observation is going to be an individual person. So, uh, so these are sources of micro data. We call that micro data. Uh, in addition to these classic economic variables, uh, the BLS also has some slightly more maybe exotic stuff. So, for example, they have the American Time Use Survey here. This is a survey where they have a whole bunch of people basically write down what they're up to all day. So you can use this to find out things like, you know, how much time do people spend with their children or what are the trends in the amount of leisure which people uh, take. So I'm just going to click over where it says text files over here just so you can see sort of where the data is hiding. So if you see here, they have data files. And actually, even if you click through on the data files, you still have to click a few more things to actually get to the data. But in here, you'll see all the documentation about the data. And anytime you work with data, you always want to make sure you read the documentation. 
Uh, so this will tell you how to use the microdata files, instructions for downloading them. And down here, you're going to see the data dictionary and the codes. Uh, so you always want to read the description of the variables that you use. That's like a really basic rule of thumb for any time you're working with data. So always look for the supporting files, which are going to give an explanation of what the variables are. There's one other thing I want to show you uh, in BLS data, one other set of data sets, which is really useful to a lot of people, and that's their longitudinal surveys. So these longitudinal surveys, as you can see from the descriptions here, they generally start with a bunch of teenagers, uh, and then they just follow them. They interview them every year or two over, a, you know, over several decades, uh, and uh, they ask them all sorts of random questions about all kinds of things about their lives. So this has turned out to be just a really useful resource. There's tons of social science research which uses these surveys. So I want you to be aware of that. Uh, so that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's the BLS data. Another big thing that you might think of, which has really big sample sizes, is the census. And I think the best place to look for census data is IPUMS. So this is a warehouse that's run by the Minnesota Population Center. And you can see that they have both census data from the US and they have census data from a whole bunch of other countries. The, uh, the advantage of using IPUMS data is that they've done a really nice job cleaning it and making it convenient for you to use. So for example, uh, if you have, you know, if you're using data from the 1960 census and the 1970 census, if they contain the same variable, then you'd really like for it to have the same name in those two, in those two data sets. So what they've done at IPUMS is, for example, they've harmonized the data by making it so that the variables would have the same name if it's the same variable. And they would code responses the same way across different censuses. Uh, so this is a really handy way to get census data. Census data can contain a lot of information. So there are subsamples, at least in the US and I think in other countries as well, uh, there are subsamples where uh, of the population who are asked a lot more detailed questions than what everyone gets asked. Uh, and so you can get a lot of really detailed information on people that way. The only downside of IPUMS is that the data which they have here is public use microdata. So public use means anyone can hop on here and download this data. And so, of course, because of privacy concerns, IPUMS can't carry all of the data which the census collects. Uh, so there is a lot of census data which might be helpful to you, uh, which is, you know, you need to apply for, uh, you need to get like a special sworn secret status from the Census Bureau for some of the data. Uh, but there, so there are various additional levels of restriction for data, and that's just to protect the privacy of respondents so that, you know, it's not easy for somebody to kidnap your children or something. Uh, the next big warehouse that I want to show you is uh, FRED2. It's Federal Reserve Economic Data. This is housed at the St. Louis Fed. So uh, St. Louis Fed is a branch of the Federal Reserve System. I'm just hovering over FRED economic data up here, and I'm going to click where it says All Series. So you can get a sense they have tons of data series. Uh, and you can see they have stuff which a central bank might care about is very well represented. So things like prices, GDP, so this GDP here is not going to be, you know, it's not going to be microdata. It's going to be an observation here is going to be the United States economy in the second quarter of 2002. Uh, so you also have spreads, you know, bond prices, money supply, the sorts of things which a central bank might care about, like I say. Uh, so this is great as a place to find data. Another really nice thing about FRED is that it's also, they have like built-in data tools. So I'm just hovering over where it says data tools here. And you can see that you can create your own maps and graphs. So I'm just going to show you, I'm clicking on create your own graphs. 
I'll show you some of the things you can do. Uh, so I'm just going to look for gross domestic product. So I'm going to select the real gross domestic product series. And just like that, it takes the series and it makes a graph. And I can adjust what years are in the graph here by pulling these handles. So the shaded areas are represent recessions. If you didn't want to have the graph shaded where there's a recession, then you can play with the graph settings down here. Uh, you can also export the graph over here. <coughs> so you can see that there are a lot of really nice tools for uh, making graphs, which allow you to have a really short time between when you have an idea and when it turns into a nice graphic. The last big warehouse that I want to show you is ICPSR. So this is a consortium of universities. Uh, they've collected all kinds of really random data about anything you can think of. Uh, it's housed at the University of Michigan. And to give you a sense of what kind of stuff is in here, I'm just going to click where it says find and analyze data. And then we're going to browse by topic. So you can see here the topic classifications. There's a lot of stuff here which is not just economics. So there's conflict, aggression, violence, and wars. Uh, there's you know legislative and deliberative bodies. So you can see there's a lot of stuff which is relevant in political science. There's also stuff like you know education, community and urban studies, social indicators, uh, lots of things across a whole range of social sciences. So I'm going to click where it says education, and then we're going to click on United States. And you can see the kinds of data that they have. So you see the first entry here is an education poll that was done by ABC News. Uh, they also have things like, you know, longitudinal study of legal careers in transition. Uh, down here we have, you know, a college trustees study. We have a comparison of methods for learning Choropleth maps. Uh, so lots of really random things in here. The only downside to that is that the quality of the data or the, you know, the ease of use for a lot of these data sets is a little lower than it is for the data sets from like IPMs or BLS or other sources. So the ease of use is a little bit lower, but you're more likely to find something which you care about uh, randomly on ICPSR than you are in pretty much any other location. So I'm just going to click through on one of these, the Carnegie Commission faculty study from 1969. And you can see here, first of all, uh, the access notes. So the data is only available to users at the member institutions. So you're going to have to log in and prove to them that you're, um, you're affiliated with one of the institutions to use this data set. That's true for a lot of the data sets on ICPSR. Uh, and you can see... There's a code book here. You can click this link to download all files, and there's a code book here. So I just want to, because it's really important to read the code book, I'm just going to click through on a code book so you can see what they look like. Uh, so the code book is like your Rosetta Stone for using a data set. Uh, it's going to translate the things which you see in the data set into statements about the real world or at least responses which people gave on the survey, which hopefully should reflect something about the real world. You're crossing your fingers that it does. Uh, so you can see here we have like this cover sheet which has been put on the code book here. Remember this is a 1969 study, so the cover sheet was put on in 2002. And then when you scroll down here, you see there's what they've done for most of this code book is they've taken a typewritten document which was produced shortly after the original study was performed, and they've just scanned it in. Uh, so it's not, for that reason, it's not quite as easy to read in some places. I mean, if I scroll down here, uh, you'll be able to see some of the typewriting is not that great. Uh, the study description, so you always want to find out the background of the study. You want to find out who was sampled. So it was a male questionnaire survey of a national sample of faculty and they had 60,000 respondents. And you can find the technical report of the survey procedures. Procedures They tell you where to find that. Uh, and then down here is the actual code book. So here's where the typewriting is not very good. 
Uh, so what you see here is, so for example, this question here, question number 14 in the data set is the question was, that was asked to people when they filled out the survey is what is your present rank? And they filled in something for like, I am an associate professor, or I'm an instructor. Uh, but when you see it in the data set, it will say for this particular observation, the answer was three. And so then it's your job to go into the code book and figure out that any observation which had the answer of three, that meant that they were an assistant professor. So this is worthwhile to do even if you look through and you see variables which are already numbers, which you were expecting to be numbers. For example, here, this question is about during the spring term, how many hours per week are you spending in class? And so you would expect a number to be what's filled in in the cell, but you need to make sure that you actually are interpreting the number correctly. So for example, if you see the number five, what that really means is not that they were spending five hours. That means that they were spending nine to 10 hours in class per week. So you always want to make sure you read the code book. Uh, also, you always want to make sure that, you know, once you've downloaded the data, you should check the distribution of the variables, see how many observations are missing for variables. Oftentimes, not everyone will have filled out the answer to every question on a survey. So you want to just get a feeling for, for what's written there. And that way you make sure that you don't have any embarrassing mistakes in your interpretation of the data, which arise simply because you didn't understand what you were working with. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about uh, finding data sets. Happy hunting.